you entered his gates, his gates with rejoicing in your hearts and entered his courts with praise. This is a day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it, right? He has made me glad. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the upbeat. Uh, thanks for the worship time, man. And uh, I don't know, we just, that victorious thing that we've got in Christ, uh, if we can uh, keep that in mind to overshadow all the stuff that's maybe going on around us so we don't become overindulged in just the, uh, whether it be ordinary life or whether it be these tragic things that take place. And it's not an I don't care attitude. It's just a, man, God, I know you couldn't care more. And the unbelievable part about it is just the realization that God is using and cranking down his timetable to bring about, uh, even though we're at the Christmas time, his first coming, to bring about his second coming. And when you begin to look at all that he went through to get him here the first time, it's not uh, out of the a stretch of the imagination to understand it's going to have to put a few things together to get him here the second time. Because God's not able? Uh-uh. He's just wanting, as Peter says, everybody to come to that repentance. And man, uh, with the days the way they are, with not knowing one thing from another, whether it's a health issue or whether it's a car accident or a plane crash or whether it's terrorist activity, it's just good to know that we're ready. But man, it's great to know that the people around us are ready as well. And that's why as a church we meet together that we would remember our salvation. But then if it's really great salvation, man, let's share it with others. Uh, with Christmas time coming on, a time of year where obviously there's more emphasis on giving than there typically is at other times. And I just will share with you a few thoughts that I've had about this giving. Um, that, you know, it's about we end up in this process of buying, giving, and receiving as well. And, you know, we could pretend, but let's face it, uh, not everybody gets into it, right? And, you know, the best year, and Julie will tell you, that my biggest frustration with Christmas is I can't do enough physically, financially, whatever, be able to do enough. I can't, I'd love to go to everybody's house. I would love to eat everybody's dinner. I would love to go ahead and have a gift that would be just perfectly cut out for you and everything like that. And it gets frustrating when there are limitations to that. And whether it be of time or whether that be of just literally abilities to stretch and to go or whether that be financially, that sometimes it hinders our ability to do so. It's what makes Christmas kind of stifling to me. And at one point in my life, I did have... Uh, I don't want to say the world by the tail, but I was in good shape, and uh, it was so fun that year that even though our family traded gifts or names, you know, and we bought gifts for one of the kids or whatever and went together to get mom and dad's, I was able to do that plus still get everybody else a gift as well, and it was delightful. I mean, it was so much fun because it was unexpected and surprising, and that's what to me is uh, what makes it awkward sometimes when we either have gifts that, man, we really want to do more, and we feel almost ashamed, or you can feel inadequate, right? And at the same time, then, there are those obligatory gifts, right? Those that you've got to get, because Aunt So-and-so always gives me the fruitcake. So let me see if I can come up with something every bit as distasting, or de <laughs> whatever, untasteful is what that is, you know? Uh, despicable gift, you know, that uh, we give back, that they get the idea, I don't need any more fruitcake. I just started returning them the next year, regifting. That's what fruitcakes are for, right? They just get passed around year to year. But, uh, and maybe you like it. That's okay. I don't need to know that, you know, but because uh, I can't just look at it and go, man, there's just way too many things in there. And it's like Julie eating, won't eat the Brunswick stew because she said there's just something about floating corn I can't go for. It. Now, <laughs> you're with me, Joel, aren't you? You're with me. So gifts, right? It's all in the packaging sometimes. And then sometimes how people can wrap up the best and the neatest looking gift and you open it up and it's like, oh, okay. Uh, and how do you respond to something that, you know, maybe you weren't really looking for? Now, I think it's interesting to look at gifts and it's interesting to think about gifting and it's interesting about receiving gifts and because I think it tells a lot about us. And yet, you know, at the heart and the core of it, you know, in my mind, what makes a gift really, really worth a lot? And it's usually the time or preparation or the thought that went into it. But isn't one of the most amazing gifts the one that you didn't have on your list, that never gotten you anything before, that you didn't feel that you had a close enough relationship to or anything in that regard, and out of the blue, out of nowhere, here comes this gift from that person. If there's one thing that's even more exceptional, it's when it's one that doesn't even have a name on it, and it leaves you wondering, wow, where'd that come from? And I say that because aren't those really stupendous gifts? Because it's so out of the blue, and it's not anything that was anticipated, expected, or obligated. 
but rather instead it was something out of just complete sensitivity and appreciation. Sometimes those can be very valuable. Oftentimes the value in them is because of the person that gave them. At other times it's because it was somebody that would just happen to overhear you saying, I would really love, and you knew you couldn't afford it, but they went ahead and stretched to do so. Those are gifts that people cherish, correct? And I mean, it's so phenomenal. And yet, because of limitations, we're not always able to even to do that. But I think that in this gifting time of the year that it's vital that we look at it, that we look at even to see what God had to say about giving. And I don't have a litany of passages to show you. I've got a few. But what I do want us to look about is to see that it was behind God's motivation, too. That while he were yet sinners, that he gave his son. That uh, Jesus gave himself. And that the ultimate gift was him even in coming, right? And it was a nice little neat package laid in a manger, but it was so much more than that. And all the time that went into it to put it into place. That's the part that's phenomenal. So if you've got your Bibles, I'd like to start by showing you this passage over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Because at the very last verse of this passage, it talks about this with God and what he had done and Paul's outlook upon Look, or outlook, but looking back, looking up to God, but looking back on history and what he had to say about the salvation we've got because of the Lord and Savior we've got. It's very simple. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15 simply says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, a gift that is just leaves you speechless. There aren't enough words. There aren't enough thoughts. There's not enough ability to really put together everything about it. You just kind of stand there in awe and go, wow, that mind must pray. God, I apologize to you that we can get so caught up with our world, or I get caught up in mine anyway, to the point that I can lose my awe of you. That awe that would at times just be, you are so awesome. The awe that at other times is just, oh, I can't believe you did this. And Lord, that um, how easy it is to take for granted our salvation because you've made promises, great promises about it and how complete that it is. And yet, Lord, one of the worst things we can do is to take it for granted and in doing so, just believe it's ours and now we can do whatever we want because of your great grace and that we can be so thoughtless as to never consider, wait a minute, am I supposed to pass this on? And Lord, I thank you that salvation is one of those cool things that grows, the gift of it grows as we experience life and recognize our sinfulness that suddenly we understand sins you forgave us for that we weren't even aware of, let alone the biggies that we thought we needed to be forgiven. And Father, I just bow before you in awe of that, that you would see me in my plight. You would see me in my failure. You would see in spite of great intentions, Lord, and what the world might even at times consider goodness, you'd see the reprehensible evil that is in me. And you died that that could be overcome. You sent your son, God, Jesus, you were willing to let go of heaven and to unlock your equality with God and the Holy Spirit to be bound in the human flesh of not just a man, but at first a baby. You presented yourself vulnerable. And it's in that that today we stop and we consider as we come into Christmas what you did in providing a gift. And if we're to be like you, might we consider, Lord, and apply our gift giving different this year. Might it be, Lord, from your perspective? And might it not just be about packages and bows, but might it instead be, Lord, about things that we can say and share? Because truly, we've all experienced that gift as well, the gift of encouragement, of a nice compliment, not flattery, but true, sincere appreciation or admiration. And God, might we love and admire those that are around us, not only our friends, but even our enemies, enough that we would not want any of them to perish, Lord, but because of the Spirit of God that dwells in us, that we would want all to come to salvation. And might we begin to see, Lord, that not only at times are we the giver, but at other times we just transport the gift. And so today, God, in spite of my inadequacies, my fallibility, in spite of me still, in spite of me, Lord, having your Spirit in me still being so human, God, I pray that you would combine the power of your strength, of your Spirit, and that you would pour forth through my mouth today, not to maybe put together such a polished message that everybody sits here and goes, wow, God, but rather instead, so that there would be a scripture here, 
a thought there, something said, Lord, through my mouth that really came from heaven, that those that are here today would each know that as that first song we sang about, I love your presence, that your presence here. Might we recognize, Lord, that presence and even admit that I was unaware of it, but might we also at the same time embrace it and hold on to it and carry it forth that this year, Lord, that our lives would be different because we've been touched by you. And then as we touch everyone else, it's the touch of God to them. In the same way that I desire to speak on your behalf, might we live on your behalf to you be the glory, Lord. Might we live in such a way that we continue to pass you on to others, a gift that circulates around the world again and again until you come back, Jesus, for us. So I pray for your help, and I pray for your your will to be done, and your word to be said in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So with this thought about this indescribable gift and, and all, I don't know if you've ever thought much about what goes into it. But before I look at what went into it with God, I'd like to consider a little bit about what goes into it with what we receive. I mean, there are all kinds of things I could talk about, some that are funny and this and that, and I don't know, some that aren't so funny. I could talk about my brother-in-law, Greg, and I, because Greg and I, Julie's side of the family, they wanted to do the trading, and they put a limit on what it was supposed to be, and we decided it would be a whole lot more fun if we could just keep getting each other's name. And some of you have heard me tell this story before because I thought it was just rather clever, but we would do whatever it took to be able to get each other's name, and finally they decided to keep us out of it. There was no way that I could make sure I got Greg Sullivan's name and Greg got make sure he got mine. And it was still a luck of the draw. I would get his name and he would get mine. And we would make this big ordeal and wrap up this $20 bill and wrap it up and then give it to each other. And he'd go, oh, man, is this so special? What did you get? I can't wait to see. And we'd pretend like it was like, ah, you know, we were all, because that's the way that you're supposed to get gifts. It's, oh, I can't believe you were thinking of me. This is so nice. He's like, it's just easy to give each other 20 bucks and just go out and buy something you don't want, right? I mean, let's be practical and real about some of this stuff, you know? And it's just like dads at Father's Day. Do they really need another tie? Do they want another pair of socks? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think they'd rather have just money sometime. Dad, all that money you gave to me, here you go. Ah, your dad might have a heart attack, but I think he'd like it. So, you know, it's that kind of thing that sometimes, but there's other things behind the gift. Not only is it the motivation of the person, and is it the cost, and is it sometimes the painstaking stuff of when you make something for somebody? Not only is it that, but it's when you go out and you buy or you spend your time online and you, and I mean, some people just don't understand how much time it takes to find the cheapest way to get the best gift, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. It takes time to shop wisely. And then, you know, how many of you have set your budget, but your budget gets blown because you find something for yourself while you're out there and this is too good to pass up. I mean, let's face it. There's some of us that, right, we buy gifts for ourselves while we're getting gifts for others. Right. (laughs) Thank you. Brother, I relate, yes. (laughs) But I mean, it's just that way. What is there about us with these things? But so there's this thought of the person we need to get the gift, ought to get the gift, got to get the gift for. There's then this desire and we go out and we find a gift and it's the right price. We, We purchase the gift. We bring it back home. We get our wife to wrap the gift, you know, because many guys don't do it. And in fact, you know, paper bags are fine with me. Store-bought plastic bags. I don't care. You don't have to get it fluffy fluffy and foofy and put all the tissue paper. I'm just good with just give me the gift, you know. Uh, I never understood this whole big wrap-up deal, but some people get into that. And my wife's one of those. But, you know, I just say, guys, we go, here, here, you know, and it's good. But, but we go into preparation then to make sure the gift is presentable, the present's presentable, and we pass that on. And then we, they get it, and they've got to go through a certain routine to show you how much they like it. And if you're really good, you not only say thank you, but you write a thank you letter. And man, boy, are we losing that, aren't we? I'm really bad. I, I feel like a hero to send an email or a text. Hey, thanks, man. You know, but, but, but used to be you'd write it out, have to put a stamp on it. Now, but let's go the other way. Because we all complain about how much stuff costs. But when you think about where all something came from, and there's no way that, and I thought about a diagram, and I thought you'd be bored to death. It'd be like an econ class, you know, if I tried to show you. But, but if you back things up, and, and it's different with different things. Jewelry would be one thing. Uh, something that's made, you know, clothes would be another. Um, other things are practical tools or whatever, tools, right? Let me give you a clue, too. You know, if you really want to do something, folks, when it's a wedding, buy tools. The bride gets all this stuff 
And, uh, you know, the foo-foo and all the stuff of the house and the bathroom towels and the monogram. You kind of leave the guys out a lot of times. I just want to be honest with you. You leave the guys out. The groom's as much a part of this wedding as the bride is. Sometimes they would like tools, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever it might be. Sorry, Kathy. But, you know, both of them are there. And, uh, you know, we need to get gifts that apply to the guys too. But backing up now. So whatever the gift may be, if you trace back down where all it's come and all the hands that have touched it, it's flat out amazing. Growing up on a farm, I know we grew corn. I knew we grew soybeans. But did you know that the soybeans are a big part of a lot of your clothes or the different things that we've got? Because, and the plastics that get made and everything. Corn can be a part of that as well. But you've got all kinds of hands that have touched that. Even though you picked it up off the shelf, there was a store owner that invested their money that bought the shelves that went ahead then and did the advertising, paid for the lights and everything to be on that you could see these products. They ordered them. And it's so difficult in this day and age to guess how many of these certain things you need and which colors and which sizes, right? And then you've got the person that was selling that to them, and you've got the manufacturing behind that. But I'm telling you that when you really think about it, I'll bet you about anything that we have has been touched probably well over a thousand times by somebody's hands. And all of it began from either, if it's metal, digging it out of the ground, right, that God gave us. If it's other things, it grew from the ground. But all of it then, and somebody that invested as my dad, you know, within the buying the land and then going ahead and farming the ground, the equipment and the various things and all the fighting the weather and one thing like that takes to raise the crop and get the crop out of the field, get the crop to the elevator, take it from the elevator to the manufacturer, the trains, the trucks, the whatever else that took place. I mean, there are a phenomenal number of things that go on. I mean, if you put the dominoes together, they'd circle the church outside this building several times of what it takes to get one thing that's finally packaged that you went ahead then and you took 10 steps to get to the individual. And you go, I didn't come to church for this really, Steve. I mean, what's this got to do with you and me and the price of tea in China and Jesus on the cross? Because I'm going to get to that. Because that's the indescribable gift. It wasn't packaged the way people might want. We love, as Ricky Bobby does, the baby Jesus, right? But it was the indescribable gift is the one of Jesus, the Son of God spread out on that cross. That's the indescribable part because he didn't deserve that. I did. But he did that. Why? Because he gave himself. Because he so loved us that he gave himself. The father so loved us that he allowed it to happen and refrained from intervening when he wanted to so bad. The angels chomping at the bits to rush in like soldiers to just annihilate the people around the cross. The cross. God, the snap of his fingers could have gone ahead and annihilated everybody around there and proven this is the son of God. Leave him alone. But Jesus didn't just have to bleed on the cross. He had to die. What a gift. But how many steps did it take to get to there? Because far more than manufacturing of a package that we might share with somebody, I don't think we oftentimes comprehend how far God went making sure that we got the gift. We can go back to the book of Matthew in chapter 1. And here in this book of Matthew, we can see a little bit about this. It's kind of boring. It's one of those parts that I'd like to breeze right on through. It's that genealogy stuff, you know. And some people get into that and, uh, you know, find the leaf and find the tree and go through everything in that regard. And it, it is amazing. I just figured I probably didn't really want to know who all was in my background. It would explain a lot, you know. Uh, but what I'm confident of, there's generations yet to come that are going to wish that I wasn't in their background, you know? But sorry, folks, I was there. But here in the book of Matthew, we read what uh, Matt put together here for us to understand what happened uh, from the time of Abraham uh, to getting to Jesus. And what Matthew is outlining here is the faithful tree, the tree of faith, the one that began with Abraham and God speaking to Abraham. And so it starts, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, son of Abraham. Hold on with me, a little bit boring, but man, just imagine, what if this was your name in there or your great, 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 great grandfather, grandmother's name in there? Then it would be meaningful, wouldn't you? You'd be able to go, look, there I am. My great, great, and you go times 10 was in there. But it says Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah, and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. That's how it starts out. 
I can read that fairly quick and stumble over the names and everything else. But if we stop and consider what God went through, isn't it amazing that to bring his gift here, he happened to pick an old man that couldn't father children, who had a beautiful wife but was barren, and as desperately and brokenheartedly as she wanted to have children, couldn't have children. And he didn't call them early on in life. He didn't call them when they were teenagers like Mary and Joseph. But he waited until Abraham was 75 years old and put it on him and said, look, dude, you, you've been listening to me and you've been looking for me because God promises to reward those that earnestly seek him. He said, if you'll follow me and go where I tell you to go. And Abraham says, where? He says, no, when I tell you to go, I'll tell you where to go. But he said, if you'll go with me, I want you to leave your nice house and I want you to leave the community you've been in, your family, and you and your wife pack up and you go and I'll show you where to go. And every place that you step when you get to that place, I will give to your descendants. And Abraham goes, that's a pretty good stretch. Okay, God, I understand, but uh, I don't have any descendants. No, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you descendants. God, I'm 75. Sarah and I've tried and tried and tried. God says, trust me, I will, if you will. And that's how faith works. God, us trusting God, listening to what he has to say, and the contract that I will if you will. And the if part is up to us. But Abraham did, and he left. Now, he didn't go immediately, and that's another story, because he went a ways out of town, and he stopped there. But then when his dad died, God reissued the call, and Abraham started to follow. And so the first part of this I want to tell you is when God gives a gift, he doesn't go about in normal ways of getting a gift. I mean, let's just face it. One of the things that frustrates us sometimes as Christians is we do believe God can do anything, right? Not all of you are convinced, but I am really convinced God can do anything. In fact, numerous times he said, I can do the impossible. Nothing is impossible for me. So our God's not a normal God. And we all know that God not only gives gifts to good people, but God gives gifts to bad people because we've been bad, right? And we've received gifts, not only the gift of salvation, but we've received other things that we don't really deserve, and that's my favorite passage from David is, you thank you, Lord, for not treating me like my sins deserve. But, but in this whole thing, that what God's doing here with Abraham, he's showing, he's like, I'm not going to just do this ordinarily. I could whip up a person that would suddenly have a baby. I could, he could have just, with the snap of his fingers, put a son of God on the earth. But instead, he chose to do it through unconventional, unconventional ways and means, and he placed within a promise that I would like to take you that are having an impossibility of having children, and I want to begin this with you. So it starts with Abraham and Sarah. It goes from there to Isaac and from Isaac to Jacob. And with Jacob, it's an amazing thing because he was born a deceiver. That's what his name actually meant until it was changed to Israel, which means one who wrestles with God. But Jacob had to overcome himself because his natural, he was a salesman. He was an opportunist. He would see something and take advantage of it as he did his brother's birthright. But he became spiritual. And man, he had a plethora of a bunch of kids. He had the 12 tribes of Israel when it all ended up. But why would God pick such a, you know, one of those guys? Fast-talking salesman that, you know, the hand is quicker than the eye. Why would he pick him? Because he wanted his son to have the bloodline of impossibility and unlikeliness. See, we're always looking for normal. We want to be normal. We think that we look to others to see what normal is. And God's always looking at the abnormal. And God's not always looking for people that are cookie cutters. He's looking for individuals. But God, even then, his imagination is so much greater than ours. You talk about visions of sugar plums. He had to have one when he picked me. But many of you too, right? And I think it's vital that we see that in the family tree of Jesus, there were people coming along to be able to get this gift into place. There were plenty of processes that had to take place. And a lot of them began in people whose lives needed to be changed, but he started the promise before their life ever changed. How about you? I am thankful he doesn't make us get perfect so we can get salvation. He just wants our heart to break to where we say we want salvation. And then he said, if you, then I. And he makes that promise to us. But we need to, like Abraham, in spite of sometimes getting off track, we need to keep holding to and trusting that even though we're not seeing it, that we believe and that we're going to take steps of faith to be able to be faithful unto God, 
no matter what happens because he's promised what he will do for us. So we have Jacob that was that. But then in verse 3 there, when it talks about Judah, and there's a story about Judah and all, and Judah was the one that was promised to be the tribe that Jesus would come from, so that's why it's here. But the irony was Judah didn't get his wife pregnant, although he did. But that's not the one that Jesus came from. Tamar. Is it from Tammy? Is it, you know, Tara? What is it? But no, Tamar. And Tamar was actually his daughter-in-law. Rutro, Astro. That's not good. God says you're not supposed to do that, right? That's right. But Tamar and the situation, and I don't know that I've got the time to go into the details of it, but she was married to his son, and when his son died, he just he gave him another son. He died began to believe she was the black widow, and so leave her alone. And she actually posed as a prostitute. And that just adds to it even more because here comes Judah along the way, this patriarch, you know, and coming along. And he sees her and decides, okay, let's hook up. And he gives her, you know, a promise. She turns up pregnant. She comes back and said, this is your staff. He couldn't deny it. Why would God do that? Again, same reason that Jesus was born in a barn. God did not want to leave untouched anybody in his plan of salvation. He didn't want any of us to believe we are the ones that are so good we deserve it any more than the people that believe that they're so bad they don't deserve it. God wanted to show I can use anybody to bring about my promises and to bring about salvation. Now, you know there's a point to this, right? And a part of the point is just seeing how God works. But then as we read on, we can see others that are in here. There are just countless stories of impossibilities. And some of them are very good people that had very bad things happen to them. But one of the next most amazing ones to me is in verse 6. And Jesse, the father of King David, although obviously when he fathered him, he didn't know he was a king. That crown would have hurt his mom a little bit. But, but uh, David is going to become. And David was the least of his brothers in the eyes of the prophet that went to, uh, to anoint him and all. But he, David was the father of Solomon, the great, greatest wise man, the most rich man that ever lived. But notice whose mother was what? His mother had been Uriah's wife. Well, how cool. David went ahead and picked up this poor widow. No, it wasn't cool because before she was a widow and was still his wife, David slept with her. She got pregnant. And David tried to cover it up by having her husband killed. Again, man, it's like looking at it from a, logical normal point of view it's like god come on and i share this with you because i think as preachers sometimes we portray that that the only way that god's ever going to use you is if you're really good and i'm not telling you for the sake of the fact that all of us ought to try to see how bad we can be so god can really use us i'm saying because of the badness that's in our past let's not be self-defeating here but at the same time if you're going to claim the salvation of god take everything with it and begin to understand that this package, this indescribable gift, just didn't happen. And it wasn't something that God picked off the shelf and thought that's where it began. But he knew the roots of it all. And a part of the roots that God chose to build into this genealogy of this son of God that was going to be the gift of salvation to the world, an indescribable gift, a part of what he did was he used unlikely people. But not just unlikely He didn't just use the, oh, yeah, that person there, they never get picked till last. It was more than that. He used people that were broken. People that should have been self-disqualified. And he still chose them to be the one. David had, I don't know how many wives, dozens. But of all the ones that God chose to use of David's descendants to put on the throne, it was the one that came from this lady he had an affair with. Their first child died He went in and comforted her, and she became pregnant again. That's when God says, I'll put on my throne. Now, I share that, and again, this thing goes on, and there are other stories within it, but it finally comes down to Mary and Joseph, and we've heard the story and thought about the story, and usually I'm telling the story in the dark, but but even within them, unlikely characters, they weren't wealthy, they weren't politicians, they weren't popular, they certainly weren't in the uh, Jewish uh, palace, in Jerusalem, 
In fact, they were from an area that was kind of looked at as being, does anything good come from there? And I know we have people here from Alabama, but it's like the people from Georgia always look at Alabama, but Alabama keeps coming back and winning championships. So I don't know how you look at that, but you know, there we go. And so, but I want you to see that they were from an area that was just despicable in the eyes of the world. It was a nothing place. And God chose to, out of that place, bring forth his son. Now he was born in Bethlehem. He had to do that because he promised that that's where it was going to be 700 years earlier. And so he had the census and they took place and they got down there. And of all things, and there wasn't any place for them to have this baby normally. So where was she born? Or where was Jesus born? Where did Mary have? In the stable, in a barn. Why? Because I believe with all my heart, God didn't want any person that would ever live on this earth to believe that they were too bad to receive what he offered them. And so it's in that regard that I want to go to this next phase. And the next phase about this is what do we do? What do we do? And what I mean by what do we do, I mean, it's like far as what is our part then in playing in this giftedness? How do we then become a part of that? And is God done giving? Did it stop with Jesus Christ? And that's where I would tell you, no. Heck no, it didn't stop with Jesus Christ. There's an interesting passage over here in the book of Acts I want to show you. And we know that he picked these 12 disciples. We know that after Jesus turned 30, he was baptized, went out 40 days, came back under the power of the Spirit and the influence of the Spirit, and literally being influenced by the Spirit then and what he would do. And of all things, the Holy Spirit prompted Jesus Christ to pick people from the synagogue that had graduated under the best rabbis. No. Fishermen tax collectors, the very unlikely, insurrectionists even. That's who God prompted, the Holy Spirit of God prompted Jesus to pick and select these men to be his disciples. Why? I can't begin to promise you or to tell you I have all this wisdom of God or anything like that, that I know the mind of God, but God says he gives his spirit that we can know and have the mind of God. And so what I see with it is, it's just the most logical thing of all is God wanted to take unschooled, ordinary men to make an impact on an area that really the Roman world that cherished wisdom and knowledge, you know, as they did on the Areopagus in Athens, Greece, and not Athens, Georgia, but Greece. And on the other hand, he wanted to go ahead and take these other people. He wanted to show the Jewish rabbis that, man, God doesn't look at your status and your stature and your fine flowing robes. What God looks at is your heart. And so God picked these people so that it would impact the whole world, the Roman world and the Jewish world. It would impact them to see what stirred within their hearts, the courage that they would have, the boldness that they would have, this non-dying willingness to tell anybody and everybody that would even listen about Jesus Christ. And with it, God then endorsed them then with these unbelievable, unmistakable uh, uh, spiritual gifts of healing, and, and they were able to do the same things that they had seen Jesus do, that the world had seen Jesus do. And he uses those as signs and wonders to do what? To point people to Jesus. God still wants to use you and me to point people to Jesus. He still wants to use unschooled, ordinary people to point people to Jesus. He wants them to see in us something that says there's something different about this person. They're not normal. And the sad part about it is, as Christians, we spend a lot of our life trying to fit in and be normal. If I can only have what the world has, they'll like me. And the whole thing I want you to see is that these guys, man, those disciples, they didn't have the stuff of the world. They gave it all up. Peter and his buddies that were fishermen, man, in Luke 5, they left the biggest catch of their lives on the shore, walked away from it to follow Jesus. Why? Why? Because they were convinced. They didn't want anything else to take their heart because Jesus had it. They got confused with the cross, but even Peter came back strong. And so later on then, as we see that the church in Jerusalem, so God did, first of all, reach out to the Jews to make sure them, and this church in Jerusalem sprung forth. Peter preached that message. But then later on, God appeals to Peter again, and he hits him up with this thing and wants Peter to understand that, man, I'm not done. It's not just the Jews. I want to reach out and I want you to touch base with the Gentiles, the Romans, the Greeks. I want them to know, too, about this great gospel. 
And so here in the book of Acts chapter 10, I'll try to make this brief. It's a long story, but let's go ahead and jump in. At Caesarea, so Acts 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. Good old Cornelius. He was a centurion, so a Roman centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. Well, I don't know much about the Italian Regiment, but back then, they knew about it. The Italian Regiment. And he and all of his family, notice these words, were devout. They were God-fearing. And the idea being here, not that they were just small little G-O-D, godly. Not that they were like the typical Romans that believed in the plethora of gods of all the Greeks and everything else like that. But these guys were different. They were God-fearing. Cornelius and his house. He reflected that. He showed that. It was obvious because a part of his lifestyle was he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Now, it's quick to read. I slowed down so that you would see this with emphasis. The man, this Greek over here, not a Jewish person, but this very Roman guy that grew up in a normal world that was a centurion that had to go up through basic training and all the ranks to be able to get to this and, and worked his way up and now was in charge. He didn't allow his power and prestige to stop him in his quest. Hebrews eleven six not only talks about what faith is, but it said that it's about believing God and that he rewards those that earnestly seek him. In the Old Testament, a couple of different places there, God promises them that no matter how far they go, if they return to him with all their heart, if they'll seek him in the midst of devastation, if they'll seek him with all their heart, he will be found by them. Meaning, you will see me because I'm not going to ever leave you, but you will leave me and I'll be there, but you've got to come back. And so Cornelius was one of these that sought God. And in the seeking of God, he prayed to God, even though he didn't know what else to do. Doesn't talk about him being part of a synagogue or anything, but it was just as, as, as Abraham, before there were a Ten Commandments or anything, Abraham believed God, listened to God, tried to seek God, and God finally spoke to him, and Abraham had to come to the conclusion, if I've been asking for him, I've got to believe him, and so I'm going to follow what he says to do. And as impossible as it is for me to have kids, if there's anybody who can do it, I believe the Almighty God can. Well, same way with Cornelius. I'm looking for you, God. I'm seeking you, with, and I'm going to do whatever I can. And this search of God caused him to be not only devout, which meant that he limited himself. That's what it is to be devout. You don't do everything you feel like doing. Devout means you hold to standards that you have chosen to make because you believe it's the way it should be. De Non-devout people compromise. Well, this is what I plan to do unless I get a better offer. But devout people say, no, no matter what, this is what I'm going to do. So he was a devout man. He gave, not just gave a few gifts out at Christmas time, but he gave what? Generously. But who did he give to? To those in need. That means he had a heart that was seeking, instead of seeking God, he sought people. He sought to be a tool in the hand of God to help others. He didn't believe that he was here because of how good and strong and robust and how disciplined he'd been. And man, if you just do your life this way, you'll be successful too. He instead saw be anywhere if it weren't for you. That's called humility. He was a humble man. And his humility caused him to look at his status and say, I didn't get here by myself. God, you've had a hand in this. But not only that, but if I'm here... What should I do with what I've got? And he gave generously and he looked for people that were in need. And he prayed to God regularly. I think we say prayers, but let's be honest. Are our prayers more the kind where we sit down and say, God, it's time to have time out and just to enjoy your presence. And let me tell you what I believe about you. Or are most of our prayers the kind that either come out of tragedy, catastrophe, or emergency? Or at least that, oh, God, if you don't help, blah, 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 blah. That's the prayers that I think that, one, the devil can try to inspire. 
But two, I think sometimes my logic would say that God allows me to be in binds where it's like, okay, if you're not going to pray to me because you love what I'm doing for you, then let me pray to you. Let me help you pray out of need. But what God desires is that we would just come to him because he's God. That we would enter his courts with thanksgiving in our hearts. We would enter his courts with praise. We would look at him and see that no matter what, then this is a day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad because, God, you are so good. You treat me so good. What can I do for you? How can I respond to your graciousness? And so this picture of Cornelius, I think, is pretty cool when it comes to Christmas time because he didn't wait for December 25th. He didn't wait until they were playing the music. He didn't wait until the stores had their sales. He saw people in need. He gave, but he gave because he believed he was seeking God and praying. And in the midst of that praying, felt prompted and followed through. Not unlike Abraham who followed through and went where he didn't even know he was going because he went because God had called him. God called Cornelius as well. And it says one day about three in the afternoon, Peter then had a vision. He distinctly God came to him and said, or excuse me, Cornelius said, said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. He said, what is it, Lord? So suddenly, instead of just being somebody he was praying to, he got not just a voice back, he got, whoa, his name called. Cornelius stared at him in fear and said, what is it, Lord? He said, the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. So suddenly what he was doing for others and in his seeking became something to God that he said, that's a gift to me. God's going, man, you've made me special. I've heard you, buddy. I can't miss you. I'm delighted to jump into your life. If you want me, let me come in. And I'm going to bring somebody to tell you how to let me in. And that's what began. And you read on down through the story, and Peter went through this dream-type trance, and, and God kept telling him, and Cornelius goes, or Peter said, no, no, I'll never do that because I'm a good Jew. And God's going, it's not about being Jewish, dummy. It's about being Christian. It's about being saved. It's not your bloodline. It's the blood of Christ line. And he said, I need you to take something because I'm going to do a new thing like I'd always planned on. This isn't new news, but all along I planned on bringing the Gentile world in. And so he spoke to Peter and he told him then about Cornelius. And uh, it's really interesting when you get to read this because it, it, it's just so amazing, I mean, to me. And, it's, and I guess I can relate to it because of how sometimes I'm slow to respond to what God's trying to say. How about you? And uh, anyway, it says, verse 15, the voice spoke to him a second time, said, don't call anything unpure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out and asked if Simon was there, as Peter was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, there are three men that are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them, because I have sent them. So Peter went down. He said, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And they said, We've come from Cornelius, a centurion, verse 22. He's a righteous and God-fearing man. As Jewish people, a holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. And so Peter went back, went to a place he didn't want to go, spoke to uncircumcised Gentiles, was apprehensive about it because it could make him unclean, but he did it out of God. Now, this is where I run out of time. This is where it gets difficult to tie things together. But I will look at verse 34 with you, if you will, while we're here in 10. Peter began to speak. He did go back with him. He began to speak. He said, I now realize how true it is. Show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Now, I got to tell you the rest of the story. He still needed to be saved. But God saw him and heard him, but there was still more to be done. And so Peter shared the God with him. And afterwards, the Spirit came upon him. And after that, then they said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They've received the Holy Spirit like we did. So where did they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? And Peter stayed with them a few more days. Why? To finish telling them more. Now, here's what I wanted to get across today. Gifts are given. Some with more heart and more thought than others. 
Some I'm sad to say just out of obligation. I had a passage I want to show you on that, but gifts are given. But we don't really think about how many people worked or did things to be able to have this gift ready to be given. And in the center, in fact, is the fact that with Jesus and God, God went through numerous people to bring about the gift of Jesus in the manger. But then after that, he went through further people to go ahead and put Christ on the cross. And after that, then he went through ordinary people to be able to bring the gospel to people. You and I have heard the gospel, not just because of me, but because of other preachers, people in your life, and because the word of God's been shared. But I want to ask you once again, as you're preparing for all the gifts that you might give this Christmas, have you even given a consideration to God, is there anybody you want me to tell about you? We have this tendency to believe, well, they'll see my good works and know that I'm a Christian. Not if you don't speak it. And I'm not going to say that everything ought to be show and tell, but I'm just saying that it is great if you live a good life. But you see, there are a lot of people I know in America that live good lives that aren't Christians. They're the ones that pain my heart the most because if they die with I have to take Jesus at his word. And he said, nobody can come to the father except through me. Does that break my heart? Is that fair? I can't see it as being fair, but I have to believe Jesus wasn't lying. What do you think? And so if he's not lying, then what do we need to do? We need to be about our father's business like Jesus was. We need to be like Peter and say, I don't like this. There, I don't even like those people or whatever it may be. But God, okay, if you are, then build it up in my heart to where I'll go. Give me a vision, if nothing else. But Lord, don't let me neglect doing what you want me to do. And the whole amazing thing is, folks, is I can tell you after 37 years of ministry that I did not want to do. I have no regrets being able to share the gospel with people, not just in church. It's the times I've got to share it when it's just one-on-one -on -one in various places alongside the road at a gas station or sometimes at a place like the chop shop or whatever it may be. That's the coolest thing that can take place. But if we're not fit, we'll never share Christ. And yet we say we're Christians and we're saved, but I can't find anybody in the Bible that that was all their deal was. It was to get saved. It was then you grow in Christ and you share Christ with others. Because it's left to preachers, there are not enough preachers to do it. In fact, I've told you before, but your testimony counts a times more than mine. I'm paid to do that, they think. That's why I love doing the stuff that's kind of undercover, because I don't let them know I'm a preacher. I don't want them to know I'm a preacher, because then they don't want to listen. And some people don't believe after I tell them I'm a preacher that I am. <laughs> I think I do. But... Our whole life is to be about being the distributor of the gift of God. And there'll be stories told about St. Nick and Santa Claus and the sleigh field and finding people and always making sure. But what a shame we know that story, but we can't tell our kids the story about how we share Christ. And if you have, can I encourage you this year at Christmas to tell your family the joy of what it is to witness. The joy of what it is to tell the difference that Jesus has made in your life. The joy to tell them that I had a friend that I was afraid of losing friendship. And I've had this happen multiple times where I've gone to people and say, look, man, I love you with all my heart. You're a great friend. And one of the things that I fear the most is losing your friendship. And pushing myself into your life and it was typically people that knew what I did and everything like that but I said I'm at a point where it's either I respect you and want you to like me or I respect God at the risk of you not liking me and I've got to follow through with God but I'm concerned can you tell me that you know if you die that heaven is yours and why because if you can't, I would love to tell you how you can be able to know for certain. I wish I could tell you 100% of the time those people always said, no, tell me, I want to be saved. They don't. But I at least know one thing, I will be able to stand not only before God, but before those friends and say, I tried. But I would hate to get to heaven and see people that I love standing there on this judgment day, looking at me and going, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell the real Christmas story? Why didn't you let me know? 
And see, that's what I'm concerned about, is that you will have friends, you'll have family members that you didn't tell. And yet we know right now at this time in the world that, and it's been that way all along, you never know how many days you've got, do you? So isn't it a good idea to be sure? And once you're sure and secure, isn't it a good idea to share so that they have the opportunity to at least know something that they might not have known? And do you know Christ well enough to share him? And is it just say, that's a beginning part, but Cornelius had prayed. But you see, there had to be follow through. And that's what hurts my heart sometimes, even with some preachers, is the fact that tell them the rest of the story. And I don't want to make it just this, okay, do this, check, check, check. But you've got to continue to nurture. That's why Jesus said, go forth into the world making disciples. And there's not one Christian that can say, he didn't tell me that. Because he told those disciples to tell the rest of us to teach them to observe all that Christ had said. I think it's good to look at Peter and see what he did, to look at Paul and hold people that wanted to be saved so that we're telling the whole story and not just picking one verse out so our conscience is clear, but letting them know the whole process of this thing of what it is to be conceived by God and in your heart to conceive God, but then to be born again and then to go ahead and to walk up and live, to walk with him and to share others. Because you see, if you don't finish telling them, they can't tell anybody else how to be saved other than what's become this thing about, well, this is how it worked for me. And it, folks, it's not about how it worked for you. It's how about he said it should work, right? And I don't want to take out of God's hand the exceptions. That's up to him. But you and I are tell him what the word of God says with love and out of compassion and care. And sometimes, as I found in my life, to get me started, he puts somebody I don't even know in my path. Because I don't have a relationship, I have to wonder about what if. Or somebody at the airport I end up talking to that I'll never see again. And maybe I will in heaven. So I want you to think about your gift giving this year. And in the midst of packages and feeling good about sharing in that regard, I want you to think about this. And I want you to think about other things that you can do. And do you really believe that Jesus Christ is the greatest gift and the indescribable gift? Or are you kind of embarrassed to even let somebody know that you believe in Jesus? Because man, if we, why wouldn't we want everybody to believe? And you can't want everybody to believe if you won't tell anybody. Let's pray. God and Father, uh, I don't want to put a downer on. I, I want people to leave here today pumped up, ready to go. Not because I was a cheerleader, but because of your spirit stirring within us to do what we know that we were designed to do. That every one of us, Lord, is designed to be a light on a hill. Not just so that they can see us shine, but God, so that they see you. And so that they can be saved, Lord, so that they can get to know your Savior. So that, God, they can spend eternity with all of us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would each look at our own lives and question, Lord, where are we? Is there anything else you want from us that we need to do to complete our salvation, so to speak, to work it out with fear and, and, and trembling? And God, if not, then, or if within that, might we also work it out by sharing it with others and letting them know, here's why I believe what I believe, because of what Jesus said, what the Bible shows. Do you know him? And God, in that regard, I know the sticky wicket that it is, so to speak. And I pray, God, that you would open doors and smooth out paths to, to allow folks, Lord, that want to. The dryness from their mouth and, Lord, instead, just pour forth as you promised. We looked at a couple weeks ago that not to worry about what to say when brought before people, but your Holy Spirit would give us words. But, God, might we begin by at least knowing what we believe and so I pray that, Lord, that going into this Christmas season, everybody in this room, Lord, would sit down with you and write out what they believe. What do they believe and what could they tell others it takes to, Lord, unwrap this great, tremendous gift that, Jesus Christ, you are to us. Might we respond in your name. Amen. So as you stand and we sing, feel free to let God lead you.